especially for the ones who are hurting. And Father, I, I also pray that you please speak through me. May people in here see you and not see me. God, may they hear you and not hear me. May you have your way here today. In your name we pray. Amen. Check this out. If blank happens, then what? If blank happens, then what? And the big question today is, uh, if the proverbial you-know-what hits the fan in your life, then what? And how does faith help you continue? This whole series of heroes of faith is all about just what we can learn from different heroes in the Bible, uh, of just seeing these people who are regular people who have a faith. What can we learn from them on how to encourage us with our faith, especially when the proverbial you-know-what hits the fan? Now, we all have different degrees of the proverbial you-know-what hitting the fan. That's okay. It's not a competition, people. And all of us have a faith as well in someone. We have a faith in someone or a something that we often turn to when things go bad. And that's okay too. I'm just asking you to think for a second right now, who or what is that someone or something? Now, I saw a low-level example of this play out about three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, when I discovered in my backyard, I have a wasp infestation, okay? Not just a wasp problem. It's an infestation. So, I mean, you, you might have found, like, you know, a little wasp, uh, a little hornet's nest, something in the, in the eve of your house. I mean, that is small potatoes, people, okay? For me, what I found out was, like, these nests, and I have, I have like, eight of these Texas sage bus bushes, like little round ones in my backyard. And there was a nest in each and every one of them. Plus, in my cat's claw going over the wall, there are a couple nests there. I mean, I saw these things ever since March kind of fly around. I'm like, oh, they're, not, they're probably pollinating. Love that. Oh, my God. It's horrible, okay? Like, there's just so many of them now. And, like, my backyard is, like, my safe place, my sanctuary. I love to go back there and just be with the Lord. And I'm not going out there at all, all right? These things are scaring me to death. And, and uh, I'll tell you what, okay, I, I try to take care of the problem myself. And let's just say it didn't go well. And there's a video. Okay, two things right now. Now, uh, that's a story for another time. I'm not going to show you that video today. But the example I'm thinking about, about has to do with the bug guy who came out to help me after I called the pest control company to send someone out. Now, this bug guy who shows up was just a kid, okay. I'm talking maybe 20 years old tops. And when you get old like me, you can call people who are 20 years old kids. Uh, just like, just a kid, and, and, he, and he comes, and he, he gets out of the truck, he's got the uniform on, he's, look, he's looking pretty sharp, you know, but you can see in his face, it's just, it's, it's, his face is saying, oh crap. It's just saying, oh crap. Now, basically, uh, you know, I, when I told him about the infestation, and I took him to the back, backyard and saw it, I could see also all over his face that he's filling in the blanks behind me like this. If angry wasps, then what? Then what? Now, he's been taught some things by his company of what to do. And I could see that he was super nervous. He only had a broomstick, seriously, a broomstick, and a can of powder, magic powder. Now, for him to use this powder, he's got to get close, right? And I'm thinking to myself, this is not good. And this guy is just, he has to, he has to put the powder and shake it on the infested area. And I'm like going, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You got about ten areas you got to shake that stuff on, bro. Good luck, man, right? So the only thing was going to be, again, obviously, this powder, I'm thinking to myself, it's not going to work. There's just not going to be enough powder. And so seeing how nervous he was, I, I, I kind of go into pastor mode because he's like, he's like super nervous in my backyard. And I go into pastor mode and I say, hey, you don't have to do anything you don't feel comfortable with. And his response was classic. He says, thanks. Well, it's kind of my job though. You know? <laughs> and I was like, it is. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's your job. But before he goes in to address the angry wasp with this bruised thick and can of powder, um, he fills in the second blank on the screen this way. He says, if angry wasps, wasps happen, then he says, will you stay with me? He, tell, he says this to me. <laughs> and, and it was the cutest thing. I was just like, of course, bro. I mean, I don't want to be out here. Okay, I've been telling you, I, I've been ignoring my backyard for months. I don't want to be out here. I'm just trying to show him what's going on as I'm next to my door. You know, ready to jump inside, you know. And he's like, could you stay with me? I'm like, okay. <laughs> now, now, I wish I could tell you that the angry wasp problem just went away. It did not, okay. Now, again, a story for another time. But remember, 
The big question today is this. If the proverbial you-know-what hits the fan in your life, then what? And how does your faith help you continue? How does your faith work into all of this? For the bug guy, he filled in the blanks with, if angry wasps happen, then will you stay with me? And it was this, his, random, his random faith in me staying with him that helped him continue. By the way, spoiler alert, we both survived. Okay, we did. Friend, let's get a little more serious, okay? What's the if blank happens that you fear the most? And how would faith help you continue if you ever experienced your blank? Maybe you battle fear often. And you think about your blank often. Maybe you're so afraid of your blank happening that you intentionally try to never think about it. And maybe you've already experienced your blank, like my friends did this week. And that's exactly what you're trying to do, continue when your blank happens. Now, faith we see from Hebrews, you see it defined in the Bible, not as a warm, fuzzy feeling or a positive vibe. It's a confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients, those who believed before us, were commended for. They weren't commended for their great bank accounts, uh, their great, you know, the size of the properties, or, or how many kids they did or didn't have. They were commended for their faith, not just in the good times, but in the crappy blank times. And this ancient, one of the ones specifically, and we've been going through multiple in the last series. The last one that we're going to end on today is one of my favorites. And her name is Esther. This woman is a woman of faith. As we look at her life, what I'm going to do is, uh, it's about 10 chapters long, so I don't have the time to read through every chapter with you. But I'm going to go into story mode, and I love story mode. <laughs> Let me tell you some stories. Tell you a story about Esther. I'm going to weave in some scripture along the way, and I hope that you remember this book of the Old Testament. And it's a book. Bible it means book of books, and this book within the Bible, with her name on it, tells her story. It's ten chapters long, and I, I say it's worth a read. And when you read it, you're going to see this theme. If blank happens, then what? If blank happens, then what? If blank happens, friend, then what? Not only in her life, but in yours. So at least get a, get a, a reference, uh, put it in your phone somewhere, get a picture of this, make sure you remember the, the book Esther. My challenge to you is go read it this week. It's pretty fun. It's pretty encouraging. It's actually pretty interesting too. It takes place about 480 B.C., before God the Son, before Jesus Christ lands on the earth and really expresses himself in that way, we see this story. We see the Persian Empire being this big. It's the biggest empire to date known of any empires at this time of, in the world's history. It's huge. I mean, it's encompassing you know, Europe and, and Middle East and Asia. It is, it is ginormous. It's a big empire. And this empire is ruled by a guy named King Xerxes. And he has his fortress in that little yellow spot there called Susa. And this is where the whole thing takes place. All ten chapters take place in this little yellow highlight spot right in the middle of a busy and bustling empire. Now, I want to remember again, I want you to process this. If blank happens, then what? How would faith help you continue if you ever experienced your blank? How would faith help you? Now, in this story, I'm going to use a little, a little outline I've created to give you a little understanding of where we're at each time in the story. You know, there's ten chapters, but I'm going to boil it down to five parts. Part one, Mr. Pompous' party foul. Part two, the search for Miss Pretty. All right? Part three, the sinister mistress plots. Part four, the secret uncle's plea. And part five, the queen's two-part plan. It's a great book. you got to read it. It's fantastic. And if it was ever a movie, and there's great movies out there, too. You can probably watch it, too. But here's a story for you today. We begin with part one, Mr. Pompous's party foul. This is Mr. Pompous. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you some movie clips throughout the time, throughout these, these five parts. You go ahead and guess. Tell me what movie this is from. Anybody? Yeah, The Great Gatsby. Leo here is displaying a great Mr. Pompous face. And in this part of the story, Leo, really what he, who he is, he serves as King Xerxes. So... Literally, the story begins, start reading chapter 1, with a huge party. You think you've been to a huge party? 
You, you, you go, oh, Chris, you don't know me. I mean, I, before I was saved by the Lord, I threw some major parties. I mean, these parties were significant. I mean, it was amazing. I, I mean, you, you're going like right now to pride mode. Oh, I could tell you some parties, Chris. I mean, that's awesome. You know, hold my beer. Anyways, read, read chapter one, okay? Because chapter one of Esther will blow your party away. Because what this is happening here, Xerxes is so powerful, he throws a, get this, 180 day long party. That's six months of just straight up party mode. And at the end of the six months, he goes, man, that was a good party. You know what I want to really kind of wrap things up with? An extra party. Okay, just one, just one more. Like, we'll keep it short. Just seven days this time. Party. And he just parties it up. It keeps bringing out all the booze and just going crazy. Now, in this party mode, Xerxes, what he does in this, this last week, a big banquet, he calls for his queen, Vashti, to come on out wearing her crown. When you read this, you go, what's the big deal? You know, it's a queen. Come on out. Wear the crown. But really, the commentators believe it wasn't just come out and wear the crown. It was come out and wear, wear only the crown. Just come out and wear the crown. You know, show everybody just, just that hot thing. Boo! And just, I want everybody to see this thing. You know, and just come on out. And she responds with a real quick, hell no. Okay? No way. I'm not doing that. Now, you can't do that. In this culture, you just can't, you can't do that. You can't tell the king no. So his advisors see the king gets a little bit lost. Come on, come on, come on, seriously, come on out. And she won't. And, and he gets frustrated. The advisors go, you know what you need to do? I see this, we see this is going, king. You've got to shut this stuff down, okay? This whole, like, attitude from Queen Vashti, she's not getting on board. If this gets out to the rest of the women, could you imagine? All of a sudden they start thinking for themselves and reading books and things. It's the worst thing ever. You know, we can't have women standing up to their husbands. And these dudes are, are just total schmoes. And they tell the king, and king's a schmo. He's totally just lit after a, six months and a week of partying. And he goes, you're right. You know, we've we got we to make an example of this. He puts out a royal proclamation, an official law, proclaiming that Vashti must be banished from the kingdom, from his sight, and that, and that basically he's going to banish her and replace her. To send a clear message out to all the women folk in this Persian empire, don't mess with your hubbies. If they say something, do it. Now, total schmo move, total schmo move. Now, I want to also say this before I go on. There have been a lot of dumb laws made in the Persian empire. This is one of them. Um, and, and also, I want you to know, these dumb laws that were made by King uh, Xerxes, once they were made, they could not be revoked. They are unrevocable. That was part of the rule back of the culture back then. Unrevocable. Like, Vashti, gone, right? Now, now, with these dumb laws in the Persian Empire, there's also dumb laws that happen in this country too. They're dumb laws that happen. And, and there are people out there in the room and watching online, and I want you to say for all of us, and I, I love politics. I love, I don't bring politics in here. I think it's stupid. This is about Jesus. And life's about Jesus. For those of you that read politics and love politics, I want you to know, that's, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but I want to say this to you. If blank happens, then what? What? If, if, you, if, if, you, if, your law, if that law gets passed, then what? If that candidate gets, gets, gets voted in, then what? Uh, what happens? How does your faith help you continue? How do you process all of this? This is what... Queen Vashti is dealing, dealing with. She's out, completely out. And, and, and then at this point, part one ends, and then part two begins. So a part two, I'm going to call it The Search for Miss Pretty. All right? Anybody tell me what, what film this is from? Yeah, Miss Congeniality, great film. And uh, Sandra Bullock does a great job, amazing. She's Miss Pretty in this, and she's a great job. But, but anyways, what happens in the story in Esther is that Vashi's out, and she's gone for a hot second. Queen Xerxes is like, I miss her so much. <laughs> I just miss her. I'm so stupid. I make dumb laws. I can't revoke it. The advisors go, hey, the same ones who said about the, you know, the advice earlier say, we know what will help you, king, is let's have a beauty pageant to find the next queen, okay? We'll volunteer humbly to be the judges, okay, no problem. And we're going to watch all these women come in. And it's, I want you to know, this beauty pageant is not one of the good ones, okay? It's not even trying to be about scholarships or about the brains. It's all about the 
the body. Okay, it's all about find the most beautiful woman in all the empire. There are hundreds of women who are brought in. Hundreds. Some against their will, some volunteering. And this is where we meet for the very first time in chapter 2, this young woman named Esther. Check this out. It says, this man, Mordecai, had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, um, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. Notice a few things here. This Mordecai is an older cousin. We're going to refer to him today as, as a good uncle. Okay, he's an uncle. He's an older guy, takes her in. And, and you also notice here, too, that Esther comes from a, uh, she's experienced her blank already. Her blank has already happened. I mean, here, mom and da- dad have both died. We don't know how, but we know that this young woman has grown up without a mother and a father, and has been adopted. And thank God for the adoption that, that has come from Mordecai. But this girl is wrestling with pain. Serious pain. She's experienced her blank. Now, in this relationship that she has with Mordecai, Mordecai is this good uncle. He does love her and care for her. We see that throughout the whole story. He suggests to her one day, you got to get on board with this beauty pageant and apply. And she's like, what? Yeah, I want you to do that. And, and, and get this, okay. This is one of those things when when. When we get advice from people that, that are trusted, that, are, that we love, how often do we, do we sometimes, again, this is, this is a, I think, a really bummer thing for our culture. I think there's a pride in our culture that causes us to not ask for wisdom. We don't ask for advice. We just do what we want to do. And, and, and who knows if she asked for advice in this moment, but the advice comes to her from her uncle saying, you need to apply for this thing. And, and she's like, no way. This is something, she is a Jewish woman. She ends up keeping this whole Jewish faith thing to herself. And she goes, I don't want these people to know this. And Mordecai tells her to do that. Keep it to yourself. You know, and she goes, well, I, why would I do this? This is going to be, and, and you think to yourself, Chris, it's going to be awesome. She, she's going to be, you know, be a queen. And she win this American Idol uh, like reward. Guys, she's going to, she's, the king's going to have her way with her, his way with her. I mean, when he interviews all these beauty pageants, they're not lining up. He's shacking up with all 100, 400 of them. All of them. She's just one. Not one in a million, but one of a million. And she'll be treated that way. And this advice to do something that's so, like, that doesn't make sense. Friend, I, I know there's times in your life where you go, it just doesn't make sense. But I want to encourage you to do something. I want you to, to make sure that when you're going through tough times, lean into the Lord, lean into community. Especially trusted community to help you navigate tough things. Here's a trusted community uh, person in her life, Mordecai, saying, go ahead and do this. I know it doesn't make sense, but you need to do this. And she does. Now, Mordecai, just to kind of like spin off really quick on him, he's a good uncle. He works for the king. He has some sort of like uh, guard post. We don't really know what his role is, but he's on the palace grounds. And then one day he hears these two eunuchs who are supposed to be part of the secret service of Xerxes are planning to assassinate him. <laughs> Sound familiar. Anyways, next, keep going. One day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigatha, big, sorry, Big Thana, sorry, great name, Big Thana and Teresh, uh, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. Mordecai hears this. He brings it to the attention of the authorities, and thank God they shut this stuff down. Now, Mordecai does not get a big round of applause. He basically just gets his name put into like a book like a history book of, uh, you know, just what happens in the whole kingdom. That's it. No big fanfare, but thank God the king doesn't get assassinated and the story moves on. I still want to ask you in the midst of this, especially if you are, gosh, if, if, you're, if you're dealing with, with, again, frustration, things in the politics, political world, or if you're dealing with things in your own life and you feel like, I just don't know how to approach this, ask yourself this question. If blank happens, then what? If blank happens, then what? And how does faith connect to, to, to your what? Keep going. Part three of the story out of the five parts is the Sinister Mister's plant plot. Someone give me a go ahead. What movie is this from? Yeah, Aladdin. Specifically Aladdin 2, but it's okay. okay I'll take Aladdin, all right? I, I tried to find a real life character, but, but I couldn't find anyone better than Jafar. Jafar is just the best. He is such, such a great visual to me of what Hammond looks like. There's this guy named Hammond. 
he is kind of the evil guy in the story. Haman, uh, he uh, also works in the palace for Xerxes. He is really just a prideful dude that thinks he is all that and a bag of chips. And he is walking around one day, and he's really getting the honor because he's got this kind of high, high-ranking level in the, in, the, in the king's palace. He's walking by some people, and the people bowing down. He's like, yeah, yeah, bow down because I'm pretty awesome. And he comes to Mordecai. Mordecai, who's again, the good uncle, sees Haman and goes, I'm not bowing. You're a schmo. I'm not bowing. And he's like, you know, you need to bow. No, I'm not going to do that. And then Mordecai, you know, Mordecai's like, say no. And the Haman's like, mm, and he's all mad, and he runs off. And then, then he develops this plan, a sinister plot. He knows that Mordecai is a Jewish man. So he goes ahead and develops this plot. I'm, you know what I'm going to do? And he starts complaining to his wife and his friends. He's like, you know, give, you know, give me some advice. And these people are not giving good advice. They're not. And they're like, you know what you need to do is you need to wipe, you know, in order to take care of Mordecai, wipe out his entire race. Yeah, go to the king and, and, and get him to, to do a proclamation to wipe out all Jews. Just wipe them all out. You know, and, and he goes, great idea. Goes to Xerxes. Xerxes says, Done. Puts out a royal decree, and what I say about royal, royal decrees in this, in this culture, they are irreversible. The royal decree is go ahead and just kill them all. And it's really scheduled, scheduled to happen on March 7th, about a year out. They had about a year, okay, March 7th. And, and, and Hammond's like, yes, I got him, right? I got him. I'm going to go ahead and kill not only Mordecai, but all of his family and friends. Done. And this thing goes out. And it becomes the royal decree. And, and it says this, all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. The property of the Jews would be given to those who killed them. This sounds like a movie. This is real life. This happened. And th- this thing goes out. You can imagine the, the Jewish people just going, what? In moments like this, if blank happens, then what? If blank happens happens, then what? Part four out of part five, the secret uncle's plea. Someone tell me what movie is this from? Yeah, Uncle Buck. Great movie. If you haven't seen it, see it, okay? Now, Uncle Buck, uh, and we'll call him Uncle Mordecai here, he is seeing what's going down, and he's like, you know what? Um, i, I got to do something. Meanwhile, go back to Esther. She goes through, get this, a year-long beauty tra- treatment. A year-long beauty treatment, Okay? And in this beauty treatment, she uh, gets all dolled up, and she's taking advice, not only from Mordecai, but also who's visiting her, like, every day. This is all before the proclamation happened. This is, and he's visiting her every day, and, and, and he's checking in on her. He's, she's taking the advice of also some of the people, some of the people who were in charge of this beauty pageant. And, and there's basically giving her kind of like, you know, this is what you need to say in front of the king. Well, the king loves her. He thinks she's the best one. He makes her queen. She's queen now of this whole empire. Now, Again, the way the king rolls, it's not like he's sitting there with his, with his queen every day. He's sitting there on his throne, and he sends the queen off to her quarters, and she does her own thing over there. And he doesn't see her sometimes for days, weeks, months. And that's just how he rolls with his women. He's not a great guy. So Mordecai goes, you know what, queen, we got to do something. He, he goes to Esther, and he said, did you hear about this proclamation? She said, of course I've heard about it. So well, we need to do, do something. And, and in, in this whole thing, she's like, well, what, what could I do? I, I don't even know what I could do. She's like, well, he's like, you need to go talk to him. And she's like, I can't do that. She says this, all the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in, this, in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die. We know, how, we know what he did to the last queen. Get out of here. Just dismissed her like no problem. Like what's he going to do to this queen? Unless the king holds out his gold scepter and the king has not called for me to come in for 30 days. I haven't seen him in a month. I don't, I, maybe I did something wrong. We, we don't know. But she starts talking herself out of this. Mordecai sends another message to her and says, no, you've got to do something. You have to. You, you can't let fear control you. You can't. Don't be motivated by it. By it. And he actually says this. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Let's read the last line together. Ready? One, two, three. For such a time as this. One more time, people. Wake up now, okay? One, two, three. For such a time as this. This is the classic Hobby Lobby verse of the book of Esther. For such a time as this. 
she has a, mo- a moment that she can't miss, that she has to process, is she going to take it or not? She wants the guarantee that she's going to be fine. And you would think of all people, the queen would have the guarantee. But what we saw that the first queen, she does not. There's no guarantees. Get this, friends. Let me ask you this. Have you ever missed a moment to move forward with courage because you were waiting for a guarantee? Have you ever missed a moment in your life? Where you just regret you you didn't take that step? Because what was holding you back was you wanted to guarantee that it would be fine. Everything would be fine. Friend, we don't live in a world with guarantees. Everything's not going to be fine. You know, one of the worst things you can say to someone who's grieving when they experience loss is this phrase. It's going to be okay. That's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. It's going to be okay. And there's no guarantee here for, for Esther either that it's going to be okay. Ern McManus, uh, he says this quote, if you wait for guarantees, the only thing that will be guaranteed is that you will miss endless divine opportunities. We all want miracles and then spend our lives avoiding the context in which miracles happen. We j- we're, we're just scared to death. Yet we want the miracle to happen. We want to see God do great things in, in our relationships, in, in our finances, in our families, in our friendships. We want the miracle to happen. But we are afraid to walk into the process. We're afraid to move from comfort to discomfort. And instead we're tempted to go to bypass discomfort and go right to a new comfort. And what this does is rob us from seeing miracles happen. And we miss divine opportunities. Friend, if blank happens, then what? If blank happens, then what in your life? The last part, part five, I call it the Queen's two-part plan. Someone tell me what movie, movie this is from. Anybody? The Princess Diaries. And actually, it's part two also. It's Princess Diaries too. And uh, Anne Hathaway does a great job in this movie. And in, in this story, she's going to play the part of the queen. She's Esther. Esther goes, okay. She thinks about it, and she goes, I got a plan. That's what we're going to do, okay? Now, I want you to read this. Here's the plan. Tell me what you see in it. See, tell me if you can see at least two things. Esther goes, sent the reply back to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Fasting, by the way, involves prayer. It's prayer. It's saying I'm not going to eat some food for a time in order to focus on prayer. It's not the keto diet. He, she's not saying let's all get keto for a couple days and then we'll be good to go. She's saying I want you to please pray. Pray with me, okay? All the Jews, now do not eat or drink, fast and pray for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. Now, I want you to please read with me the last line again. Here we go. One, two, three. If I must die, I must die. One more time with umph. One, two, three. If I must die, I must die. Do you remember Jesus telling you and I in the New Testament that anyone who wants to follow him must die? Must you and, we have to die to ourselves. Die to us being in charge. Die to us wanting the comfort of the world and say, God, we want to follow you. We want to be where you're at. We'll go where you go. This is Esther displaying an incredible faith in a matter of just five verses in this chapter four. I will do it. I'll do it. I'm going I'm to fast and pray. Now, what, are, what two things do you see in here that she does? Now, there's multiple things in here, but I'm going to sum them up in a two-part plan. And this is what I see. Here's your two-part plan. Fast and pray. Ask your community to join you in this when blank happens. And number two, move forward. Continue with courage, but with patience, trusting the Lord. Fred, right now, if you're going through crap, if, you're, if, if your blank is the proverbial, you know what has hit the fan. Would you please, for a hot second, look at the screen. Please, this plan is for you and I. And it reminds us of something. What I, what I tell people often when they're grieving, and I, 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 
I have the privilege of working with people and being with people who are grieving often in my life. And what I tell people is this. There's no right or wrong way to grieve. There's healthy and unhealthy. You know the unhealthy way to grieve? Is to grieve alone, by yourself. The way to grieve healthy, the healthy way, is to grieve with. To say it really quickly, unhealthy is grieve without. Healthy grief is grieve with. You grieve with God. You grieve with others. And even if you're grieving with God is this, God, I'm so mad right now. I'm so mad right now. I, I just can't get it right now. Friend, you are grieving with him. And he can handle it. He can handle it. He's grieving with you whether you see it or not. When you are going through the proverbial you know what, ask others to grieve with you. You fast and you pray. By, you talk to God. You lean into him. And you ask your community, those around you, to join you when blank happens. And then not only do you do that, this is the hardest part. And you know what I mean if you've grieved before. Here's an example. You have to move forward, even if that means getting out of bed and walking to the kitchen to get a glass of water. That is moving forward. And you, and you don't want to do that when you're grieving. You're like done with that. You just want it all to end. You've got to move forward with courage and, this is key, patience. Trusting the Lord. Because whatever you want in the midst of grief will never come fast enough. It will never come fast enough. It will not be on your timetable. And friend, I want you to know that's okay. It's okay. See, if blank happens, then what? If blank happens, then what? And hopefully if you are a follower of Christ, you know that that's the wrong W word at the end. It's not if blank happens, then what? It's if, what, if blank happens, then who? And really, to sum it up, if blank, if blank happens, then God. And this is not warm, fuzzy, fluffy stuff. This is, this is my life is crap right now. What do I do? You don't paint a smile on your face and pretend everything's great. You simply let God in. Let him be with you. Just like the cute little bug guy in my backyard was like, I don't want to do this. Would you stay with me? And you hear God say to you every time, of course. Of course. We are pressed on every side by troubles, Second Corinthians says. But we are not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Our only hope in the midst of all of the crap that you see on the screen, <laughs> it's not in the government. It's not in laws being made that we love. It's not in our candidate getting elected. It's not in the money getting in the bank account. The, our only hope. Friends, if blank happens, then God. If blank happens, then God. The story ends with an incredible just plan that she comes up with. Again, I tell you the two-part plan is that she prays and fasts, and the second part is she moves forward with courage and patience. She goes to the king, and she is hoping that he doesn't kill her because she wasn't invited. And he does the miraculous. He puts out the gold scepter, invites her in. Esther, it's good to see you. And she's like, what do you want? And he says, oh, whatever you want. And he says this phrase, up to half my kingdom. You got it. You got it. Whatever you want. And she goes, just dinner. Just dinner with you and me. And can you invite that Hammond guy that works for you? Hammond. Oh, I have, sure, Hammond, yeah. So dinner of three in the royal palace. Hammond goes back home and he tells his, his wife and his friends about this incredible dinner with the king and queen. And just like you would be probably, woo, that must be special. I got invited to sit with the king and queen for dinner. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. So good. And he comes to dinner that night and, 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 and Esther, you know, is getting ready to really unveil the, more of the plan. You have to understand this again. She has not told anyone she's Jewish. 
Not, not, no one knows this except Mordecai. So she's ready to drop the bomb. And in light of this decree of all Jews going to be killed because Haman's decree that, she, he, that he had the king make. And she sits down and she's ready. And you've got to believe, tempted to drop the bomb on him right then. Right then. At this dinner. And then the, the king goes, okay, we had dinner. What do you really want? What do you really want? And she goes, in front of Haman and the king, let's have dinner again tomorrow night. And, and you've got to read this for yourself. But I go, Why? Those of us who are grieving, we want things done now. Now. But she waits. She waits on the Lord. It just wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right time. So she waits. Uh, dinner's scheduled for the next day. Hammond goes back home, and he's all pumped about it. On his way home, though, he sees Mordecai again. And, and and he's so frustrated with Mordecai, just not bowing again. He's like, oh, even though he's going to you know, kill him eventually, he wants him dead now. You know, and he goes back home, and, he, and he's telling his, his, his wife about this and his friends. And they're, they're like, you know what you should do? This is their advice. Build a 75-foot pole, about as tall as here to the ceiling, and just impale him on it. Just, just kill him. And they're like, he's like, great idea. Start building that thing. So meanwhile, back at, at the palace that night after the first banquet, the king is having a hard time sleeping. You know what the king does? Give me the record books. That'll help me fall asleep. And, and they bring out the record books. He starts reading the record books and sees that this guy Mordecai prevented an assassination attempt uh, a year plus ago. And he goes, what do we do for Mordecai? And they go, king, nothing. Well, we got to do something for this guy. Yeah, we should, king. Well, you know what? Well, what should we do? Someone goes, hey, I see Hammond outside. He's outside doing something. Want me to ask him? Yeah, bring Hammond in. Let's get his opinion on this. And so the king goes, Ham, I'm so glad you're here. What do you do for someone you want to honor? Like big time, big time honor. Hammond, because he's a total schmo, thinks that king's thinking about him. So he goes, oh, you got to put a robe on him, parade him on a horse, around town, have someone say out loud, this is what you do for, this is what you get if, you, if the king loves you. And he goes, the king goes, great, go do that for Mordecai. Hammond's like, what? This, <laughs> what? He's like, yeah, go do it. He does it. Okay, he does it, and he's walking around town, this is what, you know, yeah, if, you, if the king loves you, and he's so mad. He's going back home, boiling in anger. He wants that pole built as fast as possible to impale this guy on it. So the second night happens, and all of a sudden, you know, there he is, at the three, dinner for three, the king goes to Esther, hey, you know, just again, like, what do you want? What do you want? Now, not only did, did Esther keep this a secret that she was a Jewish by birth, she also kept it a secret that Mordecai is her uncle. No one knows this. And then she explains it. This is, this is who I am. My people are, are, getting, are getting threatened to be killed, wiped out, including my uncle. And, and, it's, and it's all this guy's fault right here. Points to Hammond. Hammond's like, <laughs> just freaking out. Xerxes goes, what in the world? He's so mad at, at, at this de decree, how he got duped into this by Hammond. He walks outside, he's, Mrr! Hammond goes, no, 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 please don't. And, and she, he goes over to the queen, falls on her, okay. Uh, she's at a couch, okay, and falls on top of her, trips or something. The king turns around, sees him, like, on top of his wife, and he's like, that's it, okay, you're done. Moves his guys in the guards, puts a bag over his head, okay. If a bag gets put, to, put over your head in King Xerxes' palace, you're done, you're done, okay, you're done, Zos. And, and basically, the, he goes, what should I do? The king says, what should I do with this Hammond guy? And they say, oh, hey, king, we look out the window and we see this 75-foot pole being built right now. Uh, how about we impale him on it? Do it. They do. Push him. Done. Done. And, and, and then, not only that, where the story goes, I kind of wrap it up in a nutshell, you know, the king goes, I'm so sorry. We're, we're going to take care of this. Uh, all, of, all of Hammond's property, everything, uh, his position, everything goes to your uncle now. Uh, he gets everything that Hammond had. All of his wealth, property, everything, his role. Uh, Mordecai becomes like prime minister of the kingdom. Uh, and then also, so too, there's this whole governmental type thing that's done to, to kind of like reverse the decree in a special kind of like unique way uh, on the next year. And it ends up saving all the Jews. It all works. It works. It's amazing. How it all works. Now, here's the Bible trivia I want you to know something, okay? In this whole story, and I'll wrap this up with this point. If you read the book of Esther and you do this yourself, you're going to find something very unique. Not once is the name of God ever mentioned. Not once. And you're like, well, Chris, come on. It's got to, 
That seems weird. Not once. It's never mentioned once. And, and, and it made me think about this. There's no way, okay, that even with that, that tri- trivia point being true, there's no way God wasn't a part of it. There's no way. There's no way these things, these things just happened. God was involved. And let me say this to you. Just because you can't see God in your blank doesn't mean he's not there. Doesn't mean he's not there. Hebrews 13.5 reminds, uh, uh, reminds us of this truth. I will never, God says, I will never, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Never. Friends, so if blank happens, then what? How would faith help you continue if you ever experience your blank? How would, how would faith actually help you continue? Faith in God and who he is and what he can do will help you continue even in the midst of your blank by simply reminding you that you're not alone. Please repeat the last line with me one more time. One, two, three, not alone. This is how your faith helps you. You're not alone. He's with you. He's grieving with you. He's hurting with you. He's walking with you you through this. And you might go, Chris, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And I think about the words of the bug guy. But it's kind of your job right now. Unfortunately, you have to walk through this crowd. I don't want you to have to do it. You got to do it. And I'm not going to give you some warm, fuzzy note that says something good's going to come out. I'm not going to say that. What I'm going to say is that there's someone already good in the midst of this with you. And he's hurting too. So let him walk with you. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, we thank you for being so good to us. God, you, you're, you are so aware of the crap that we all deal with. We see it. Father, Thank you for allowing us to be just real with you. Hurt, angry, disappointed. Thank you that you can handle it. We ask for your your forgiveness for just losing it sometimes. But God, we're thankful that you, you walk with us through this. Father, for all my brothers and sisters right now in the room and watching online, would you please remind them simply that they're not alone. They're not alone. Please help them to grieve with instead of grieving without. God, I pray they would lean into you even if they're just screaming at you. God, I pray that you'd help send the right community to be around them. And may they lean into that community too. And Father, I pray that you please just, just help us, God. Help us to be Could the rest of us, God, in the room be so honored and so privileged to be able to work and walk with those who are hurting? Would you give us the honor to do that? To be extensions of you, to sit with them as if you were sitting with them, to hug them as if you were giving them a hug. God, I pray that you would please use us. People are walking through their blank. Oh God, we need you. We love you. We thank you for how faith helps us continue to take the next step. In your name we pray. Amen. This time of communion that we've set up is just something we get from Jesus. We didn't make it up. He asked us to do this when we come together. To remember his sacrifice, remember his love. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to go get your packets by the giving boxes. And come back with those packets and your packets will have a wafer symbolic of his body broken and the juice symbolic of his blood shed. What I want to encourage you to do is sit down. Come back, take it when you're ready. Just, just ingest it. But, you're, but what you're doing, you're saying, thank you, God. Thank you for loving me. And you're also being reminded that he went through a blank too. He knows how you feel. Let him just sit with you in this moment as you thank him for his love, as you remember his blank that he went through too. If you need prayer at all, I'll have a friend over there praying for you. And I'll pray for you over here in this corner. If you want to put a name on a light bulb for a one that you're praying for, you can do that too. If you're not invited to go get your 
packets and come on back and sing this last song with us.